On that day, every soul is paid for what it earned, and none shall be unjustly treated. Lo, God is swift to reckon. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة The first of our salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم الله مسلم The second in honor of أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al-Asri wa Al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Imam Muhammad bin Ali Al-Mahdi, Salawatullahi wa Salaamu Alaikum. Imam Muhammad bin Hassan bin Ali al-Mahdi was born on the 15th of Sha'ban in the 255th year after Hijrah, revered by many as the Messiah of the religion of Islam. His life has to be examined in depth, for he is the awaited savior of the religion, the one who will bring justice and remove all forms of oppression and indeed all forms of cruelty and tyranny. You find that the discussion concerning the Imam is a vital one which affects each and every one of our lives. A discussion from which many a lesson may be learned and indeed many examples may be derived. Principles may be gained theological, ethical as well as jurisprudential. And a discussion with a historical basis and a contemporary significance. Contemporary on the idea that every religion in the world today believes in a Mahdi. Every religion in the world today believes in an awaited savior. If you were to study the scriptures of each and every religion in the world, you'll find within their scriptures there is the discussion concerning an awaited savior. A savior who will remove all forms of tyranny, will remove all forms of oppression and instill justice and peaceful equality within the world within which we live. For example, if you were to study the Avesta, the Zoroastrian scripture, you'll find that it mentions a man by the name of Sao Shiant. Sao Shiant is the awaited savior, the one who will come and bring complete goodness in the universe. If you were to study the Bhagavad Purana, the Hindu scripture, you'll find that there is a man by the name of the Kalki, and that this is a man who will come at a time when the politicians will be corrupt and full of deceit, and will be abusing the innocent people. He will come and remove all the corruption and all of the deceit. If you study the Ravada, the scripture of the Buddhists, 
you'll find that Buddha Gautam speaks of a final Buddha. A Buddha who will bring enlightenment at a time of darkness to the earth. If you look within Jewish scripture, you'll find that there is a discussion of a Messiah from the children of David who will come and remove all types of tyranny and injustice. If you look at Christian scripture, there is the second coming of Jesus as the Messiah who will come with the word of God and will bring justice and equality. In other words, we find that the belief in the Mahdi is a belief not just for Muslims, but a belief of every religion in the world today. Every religion believes in an awaited savior. Likewise, when you look within the religion of Islam, you find that Sunni and Shia have more in common than they have on differences on this issue. It is obligatory on every Muslim, Sunni and Shia, to believe in the Mahdi. The only difference is being concerning whether he is alive or whether he is to be born. Other than that, you will find that there are numerous traditions, both in Sunni literature and in Shia literature, which refer to a man by the name of Mahdi, from the sons of Fatima, whose name is the name of the Prophet, who will come and bring injustice, who will come and bring justice and remove all types of injustice. Therefore, on the first level, the need to dissect the biography of the Imam is because this is a topic which refers and applies to every religion in the world today. And on the second level, the famous narration we have from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The famous narration which states, Man ma tawala mi'arif imam zamana ma tamita tin jahiliya. The one who dies without knowing the imam of his time dies the death of someone in ignorance. Naturally, every Muslim has this belief that there is a need to know the imam of our time. There is a need to understand his biography. And many questions arise concerning the imam today. As in many times people ask the question, how many people did Imam al-Askari tell about Imam al-Mahdi? What is the origin of Imam al-Mahdi's mother? Was Imam al-Mahdi with his parents for the first few years of his life or no? What was the need of a minor ghaybah and who were his representatives? What was the wisdom behind a major occultation? What are, for example, the signs of his reappearance? You find that these are all questions that are being asked today. And would you believe there are certain elements within our own communities today who have begun to question the position of the Imam. But this allows for free thought. There is no harm. Let the people come and discuss with evidence, with texts, in order that we are able to get acquainted with the biography of the Imam of our time. As we said, when we come to discussing Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan ibn Ali al-Mahdi, we begin that he was born when? He was born on the 15th of Sha'ban in the year 255 after Hijra. The question arises, what was the environment surrounding his birth? As we know very well, his father... Our 11th Imam was around 22 when he received his Imamah. There were two factions of people who were interested in understanding who his successor was. The first of them were naturally going to be his own adherents. Naturally, they were going to be the people from his own school, from the religion of Islam and from the school of Ahlul Bayt. These people had traditions at the time which had spoken about the fact that there will be 12 Imams after the Prophet, or that there will be 12 Khulafa after the Prophet, as in if you were to dissect from the time of our sixth Imam, when people around that time, like Abu Sa'id al-Asfari in his Asal, which is available until today, people such as later in the time, Imam al-Bukhari, in his Sahih, Imam al-Bukhari was living in the time of Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, and Imam al-Askari. You find Al-Qasim ibn Ibrahim al-Rassi in his book, Al-Rad ala al-Rawafid, Fadl bin Shadan. All of these had spoken of the names of the Imams of Al-Muhammad 
or had spoken about the number of the caliphs after Rasulullah, or had spoken about a Mahdi being born from the line of the Prophet, as in you find Imam al-Bukhari, his Sahih, Sahih al-Bukhari, is with us until today. Imam al-Bukhari was living in the time of Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, and Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Bukhari, in his book, Sahih al-Bukhari, has written down about the fact that not only there will be 12 caliphs after the Prophet, but that there will be a man by the name of Mahdi from the line of Fatima who will come and bring justice and remove all forms of tyranny. In other words, there were many texts which were available, which at the time were already discussing the Mahdi. The Shia of Imam al-Askari were wondering when is the Mahdi going to be born? They were one faction who were interested in the birth. Another faction that was interested in the birth was the Abbasid Khulafa. Naturally, today you will find some people who say, what's your evidence that Imam al-Mahdi was born then? Imam al-Mahdi is not born. Imam al-Mahdi will be born later. Our reply is that number one, you already had texts which mentioned 12 Imams and his name. But that number two, if Imam al-Mahdi, there was no sign of his birth, then why would the Abbasid Caliphs put Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari on the house arrest? Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari, what did they have? Huge armies? Did they have a hundred thousand people standing outside their houses? If you look at the life of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari, they had relatively few followers who had access to them. Therefore, today, when someone says to you, I don't believe Imam al-Mahdi was born, what's your evidence? Alongside texts such as the text of Fadl bin Shadan or Abu Sa'id al-Asfari, or for example, the texts which mention the Imams, say to them, then why were the Abbasid Khulafa standing outside his house, waiting for one of the women of the house to give birth? If there's no such thing as Imam Zaman, then why would the Abbasid Khulafa put under Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari under house arrest? In other words, these two groups were surrounding the house. And I need to make something very clear for you. This discussion is the most vital discussion of all the Imams, which I need you to understand because it has some delicate points. Imam al-Askari, did he tell a lot of people about Imam al-Mahdi? I don't believe he did. I don't believe Imam al-Askari told many people about Imam al-Mahdi. And I believe if you research the sources, you'll find Imam al-Askari did not tell many people. If you count them, I am even willing to go as far as saying that some of Imam al-Askari's closest confidants and advisors did not know about Imam al-Mahdi's birth until the day of the birth. Someone will say, what do you mean? I'll say, who are the ones who knew about Imam al-Mahdi is only a very close group of people. Who are they? You find, for example, amongst them, Abu Hashim al-Ja'fari. He knew about the Imam. Ahmed ibn Ishaq. He knew about the Imam. Two ladies, Imam al-Askari's aunties. Imam al-Askari had two aunties from his father, Imam al-Hadi's side. Hakima, who was buried in Samarra and Khadija, and amongst the other close confidants, people like Abu al-Adyan. Other than these, I don't think Imam al-Askari told many people about the birth. And I will go a step further in saying that I do not even believe Hakima knew about the birth of the Imam until even the day of the birth. Someone will say, why? Because Imam al-Askari had to be very careful who exactly knew about his son. Imagine, your son is going to be hujjat Allah fi ardi. Your son is going to be the proof of Allah. Do you stand outside your house and say, everyone, my son's born, please come and visit him. We'll have a baby shower or something. You're more than welcome to come. On the contrary, Imam al-Askari, no way would he tell that many people. Even later on, people when they asked why Imam al-Askari didn't tell, because Imam al-Askari knows there are certain people we can't trust, even from our own family. From our own family, there are certain people we can't trust about Imam al-Mahdi. 
And even you, there were people in the house of Imam al-Askari who did not know which of the ladies in his house would give birth to Imam al-Hujjah. What do I mean? This is the first important point. There were a number of ladies in his house. There was a lady by the name of Narjis. There was a lady by the name of Saliq. In the books of Hadith, we have traditions about the wife of Imam al-Askari. As-Saduq says, and Tusi says, and Ibn Rustam al-Tabari says, and Mas'udi says, she is Narjis Khatun, who is of Christian ancestry. Kulaini says that she is of African ancestry. The question arises here, that today some people have come and said, is Narjis of Christian ancestry or is she of African ancestry? Let's look at Narjis firstly. Narjis and Saliq were the two women who people had claimed were in the house of Imam al-Askari when it was the time to give birth. Narjis, who was she? Narjis, Imam al-Hadi one day told his companion, Bishr. He said, Bishr, you are of the people of Medina, of the Ansar. I want you, O oh Bishr, I want you to do what? I want you to go to the river Forat on the banks of Baghdad. Here, take 220 gold dinar with you. Bishr said, why, O oh Imam? He said, go there and you will see that a ship arrives and that there is a man who takes out a number of slaves. And when this man takes out the number of slaves, the man's name will be, according to different narrations, you find that his name was Omar ibn Yazid. And you find that this person will come out with a number of slaves. When he comes out, you will see one particular slave who will come out. People will be bidding her and he'll try and make her move her veil. But she says to him, please do not touch my veil. And when the people are bidding, she keeps rejecting whoever bids. She keeps rejecting, she keeps rejecting. Until eventually, you will find someone will say, I bid 300 dinar and I'll give you whatever you want. And she turns around and she says that even if you gave me the kingdom of Sulaiman, I will still not come towards what you want. Then you go forward and you pay 220 gold dinar and give this letter to her. When she reads the letter, you will see that she kisses it and then she will come with you. Bishop says, I went, the bidding began, I went, I gave the letter, she kissed it and she came with me and then she began speaking in Arabic her whole story. She said, my name is Malika or Malika. I am the daughter of the Caesar of Rome. I am here and I will tell you my story. My father wanted me to get married to my cousin. He invited more than a thousand dignitaries, priests, and all of the holy personalities came. On the day we wanted to get married, there was like a shaking in the building. The wedding was called off. Again, there was a day when we wanted to get married, there was a shaking in the building. Again, it was called off. My father was worried. Why is this bad omen happening to us? She narrates that in my dream, after all of this had happened, I saw a dream where I saw the Prophet Jesus come with all of his companions towards the Prophet Muhammad and all of his sons. And the narration says that the Prophet Muhammad said to the Prophet Jesus, we want to ask your daughter for your daughter's hand in marriage for our son Hassan al-Askari. The Prophet Jesus said it was our honor. She said, I woke up from this dream and 14 nights later, I saw a dream. Having accepted this dream in my head, I saw a dream where I saw Fatima al-Zahra speak to Maryam. And in this dream, I asked, when will I see Hassan al-Askari? And Fatima al-Zahra said to Maryam, when your daughter, when she comes towards the religion of Islam, then there will be a union between the two of them. She said, I was waiting to see when this union will be in our soul by Imam al-Askari when I saw him in a dream that you will come on the, there will be a war between the Muslims and the Romans. You will come on the riverbank and you will be sold for this amount. 
when the person offers this much and there is a Roman letter, accept it. And that is how I came. And Bishr says, I took her to Imam al-Hadi. And when I took her to Imam al-Hadi, as I took her to Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Hadi said to her that you are honored by Allah on this earth. This is the narration about Narjis. Now there's a question here. And I need you to understand these delicate points in order that we understand the basis of our Imam's biography. al Kulaini mentions that the mother is from Africa. Saduq has a narration like Tosi, like Ibn Rustam al-Tabari, where they all talk about the fact that she's from Rome. Why would one say from Africa, the other would say from Rome? Even the close confidants of the Imams themselves, they knew there were a couple of women present in the house of Imam al-Askari. One was called Narjis, the other was called Saliq. When the Abbasid soldiers were surrounding the house, of Imam al-Askari, Saliq came forward and said, when they asked, is there any woman who was pregnant here? It's as if Saliq knew that she wasn't the pregnant one. She came forward and said, I am the one who is pregnant to defend the life of Narjis. Very important point. And that's why the Abbasid soldiers kept on watching Saliq until after a year and Ubaidullah bin Khaqan passed away, that's when the Abbasid soldiers finally gave up on Saliq and watching her. Some people came and said, for example, that the only reason you say Narjis is because Narjis was of high nobility. And you didn't want to say that Imam's mother was a slave girl. On the contrary, we in the school of Ahlul Bayt, before Imam al uh, Mahdi, there were other Imams whose mothers were slave girls, weren't they? We could have easily changed their story. Others say you only made it a story related to Christians because at the end Jesus and Mahdi will come together. So you try to make it this happy story, this romantic story of the togetherness. On the contrary, we believe in Jesus even before any of this story. Our Quran spoke about Jesus 250 years before this story. In other words, what you find is that the first vital point is what? The first vital point is those who come today and say, but al Kulaini mentions this and so on. There wasn't only one woman in the house. And that's why the Abbasid soldiers were led into thinking that it was the lady of the African descent. This is number one. Number two, so what happened? You see on the night of the 15th of Sha'ban, Hakima, the auntie of Imam al-Askari herself says, I did not know which of the ladies is the one who's going to give birth. She says, I don't know. Hakima says, I don't know. Do you know why? Because Narjis did not have the signs of pregnancy on her. Someone says, how can you not have the signs of pregnancy? What are you talking about? Musa's mother had the signs of pregnancy? Did Musa's mother have the signs of pregnancy or no? No? Why did Musa's mother not have the signs of pregnancy? Because Pharaoh would have cut the baby into pieces with the mother, isn't it? So didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conceal her pregnancy? If Allah can conceal the pregnancy of the mother of Nabi Musa, why can't he conceal the pregnancy of the mother of Imam Zaman? Hakima says, I did not know which of the ladies was going to give birth until Imam al-Askari, my nephew, came up to me and said, Auntie, tonight you're going to come to my house. Break iftar at my house. And I want you to stay in my house for tonight Allah's proof on earth will be born. Say the Hakim narrates that I went to the house that night and I looked at Narjis and Narjis did not have the signs of pregnancy. She said, even when the Imam said to me tonight is the night, I'm looking at the woman, they don't have the signs of pregnancy. I came, Narjis came to clean my feet. I said to her, no, I have to clean your feet. You are going to be the mother of the Imam of this time. She narrates that that night the baby was born. And she narrates that we heard a verse come out from the mouth of that baby on that night. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surah 28 verse 5, You find that this verse was read by the Imam as soon as he was born. Therefore, on that night, we need to understand a concept. Not everybody around Imam al-Askari of his Shia 
were told about the birth of the Imam. No, there were some you can't trust. The first of them, Imam al-Askar, his brother Ja'far. Ja'far, do you know what he used to do? When Imam al-Askar would fall ill, Ja'far would go behind his back and tell the Abbas Khulafa, come home now, the Mahdi is going to be surely leading his prayers. And that's why there's a fundamental question which I need you to all understand. Imam al-Mahdi, he's born in the year 255. Do you agree? 255? Okay. Imam al-Askar, when did he die? Which year? 260. Excellent. So he's born. There's something which needs to be asked. When a baby is born in a house, say the soldiers have been outside that house, the soldiers are surely going to recognize after six months, after a year, 18 months, 24, that there's a, a baby they've never seen before, isn't it? So how can he live in Samarra that long without no one knowing him? How? Hasn't that question ever bothered you? If he's born 255 AH and Imam al Askari dies 260, and we always say that the Abbasid soldiers have surrounded the house. Haven't they surrounded the house? Allah concealed the pregnancy. That's I understand. She gave birth that night. That's I understand. But surely there's going to be a son walking around. And we say that he went into Ghaybah at the age of five. Yes? Ghaybah to Sohra, when did it begin? At the age of five. Or four years and seven months, for example, let's say. So where is he? You see, if you say he's around Samarra this whole five years, people will turn around to you and say, listen, are these soldiers blind? They can't see a kid walking around? It's because he wasn't in Samarra. He wasn't. His father sent him shortly after birth. First, he sent him outside Samarra for 40 days. And then after that, his father sent him to stay with his grandmother, Hudaytha in Medina. If he's in Samarra, the soldier's going to look at the child and say, hold on a minute, why are we all getting confused here? Kill the child. Send him to live in Medina. When I'm about to pass away, that's when he has to come back from Medina. Imam al-Mahdi's first few years in his life were in Medina, not Samarra. If you say they were in Samarra, your whole argument falls. It's impossible he was in Samarra. Imam al-Askari has to send him out to Medina. And that's why it's when some of Imam al-Askari's companions would come and say to him, where's your son? He'd say, if you go to Mecca for Hajj, you'll see him. And if you go to Medina, you'll see him. It's because there was no way his son was living with him in Samarra. If I'm Imam al Askar and I'm walking in the house and my son's next to me, you think the Abbas' soldier's going to look at me and say, MashaAllah, your son looks good today? So Imam al Askar sends his son where? To Samarra. And that's why when Imam al Askar died, you know, we always remember the time of 8th Rabi' al Awwal and around that period, don't we remember Eid al Zahra and so on? When Imam died, 15 days before he died, do you remember the story I narrated yesterday? He told Abu Abul Adyan, in 15 days I'm going to die. Please listen to the wording so we know how the story develops. In 15 days, Abu Abul Adyan, I'm going to die. Here are the letters for my Shia in Baghdad. I have answered all of their jurisprudential issues. Go to them. You will see Ahmed ibn al-Hassan there. When you go to Ahmed ibn al-Hassan over there, go there, answer their questions. When you come back in 15 days, please listen to the wording. When you come back in 15 days, you will hear that Hassan al-Askari has died. You will have with you the letters. And you will see the one who asks you for them and the one who prays over me and the one who knows the answer to how much is in the yellow bag. He is my successor, O oh, Abul Adyan. Abul Adyan, what did he do? Abul Adyan left. He went to Baghdad. He stayed in Baghdad. After Baghdad, Abul Adyan came back. 
Abu al-Adyam narrates, when I came to Samara, Samara, everybody had come out. Hassan al-Askari has died. He said, I went. I went where? And do you know, when Imam al-Askari was ill, do you know who told the Abbas at Khulafa that he's ill? His brother, Ja'far. His brother, Ja'far, brother of an Imam, tells the Abbasid Caliph, listen, Hassan al-Askari is ill. I'm advising you quickly go to the house and check. Abu al-Adyan, and that's why Imam al-Askari didn't tell everybody where Imam al-Zaman is, because Imam knows you can't trust those close to you. Abu al-Adyan, he doesn't even tell him. Oh, Abu al-Adyan, you will see me. He says, look out for these signs, Abu al-Adyan. See how particular the wording is. Look out for the signs. If Abu al-Adyan, even Abu al-Adyan, I can't say to him exactly everything. I give him signs. Abu al-Adyan, when he returns, he says, I saw Ja'far saying, I'm the new Imam. He was about to begin his salah. Someone came and removed him and said, I have a greater right on this prayer. Now question. If Imam Zaman was living in Samarra all those years, would the people be confused as to who he is? No, they wouldn't. Isn't it? They'd know who he is. But what if someone out of the blue came after living in Medina and came and led the prayers? Do you see how it adds up now? If Imam al-Zaman led those prayers, someone can turn around to you and say, hold on, are you serious? So you're telling me a five-year-old came to lead the prayer and nobody had ever seen him in Samarra before? But he wasn't living in Samarra, he was living in Medina. He came back to Samarra to bury and to do the salah of his father because an imam always prays over an imam, isn't it? So when the imam came, he said to him, I have a greater right. Abu al-Ajian said, Ja'far was been used. Who is this person? If Imam was living with Ja'far in Samarra, would Ja'far be surprised? But because the Imam from a young age went to live in Medina, Ja'far was like, who is this? So he led the prayer. Everybody quickly, because people are all queuing up. No one's concerned who's leading. People are trying to get there for the mayit. Everyone's queuing up, queuing up. Then the Imam comes to Abu al-Ajian. Abu al-Ajian says, I was just standing there. The five-year-old came up to me and he said to me, Oh, Abu al-Ajian, give me the letters. He said, I took the letters. I gave it to him because I remember the Imam said to me, the one who asks for the letters, the one who prays over me. And now number three. By the time of number three, Ja'far started getting suspicious. He went and told Abbas al-Khalifa, quickly. The Mahdi is here. Quickly come. The chief judge of Samarra came. Everybody came. They entered. A person from Qom had entered saying, where is Al-Askari? They said, he's dead. They said, well, we have some khums to give him. How much khums is this if you are the real Imam? Ja'far said, what do you think? I know the unseen. Then a person came and said, 1,010 dinar. The people gave it to him. Abu Al-Adyan said, I looked at him. Where are you going? He said, I'm going back to my Imam Al-Hujjah Ibn Al-Hassan Al-Mahdi. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. In other words, the first five years of Imam Al-Mahdi's life are very much understood in our communities and need more clarification. Many people wonder, how did this all occur? Imam Al-Mahdi was not living in Samarra. Imam al-Mahdi was living in Medina. As soon as he was born, Imam al-Askari made movements for him to move away. If Imam al-Mahdi stays in the same house for five years, you think the Abbas al Khulafa will not kill him? And that's why from that period, Imam al-Mahdi went on what is known as Ghaybat al-Suhra. Ghaybat al-Suhra was part of a system which was begun from Imam al-Sadiq. What do we mean? Imam al-Sadiq began an underground movement called al-Wikala, the deputies. Imam al-Sadiq knew there's going to be the beginning of Imams who are under prison arrest or house arrest or indeed government security. So Imam al-Sadiq began Ghaybat al-Sughra. Someone says, what do you mean? How could he begin Ghaybat al-Sughra? Imam al-Sadiq began the underground movement where if you couldn't get access to an imam because of the imam being under house arrest, 
Then the Imam appoints someone for you to go and see on his behalf. Imam al-Sadiq, for example, had Mu'alla ibn Khunais. Imam al-Kadhim had Uthman ibn Isa al-Rawasi. Imam al-Rida had Safwan ibn Yahya. Imam al-Jawad had Abd al-Rahman ibn Hajjaj. Imam al-Hadi had Ayyub ibn Nuh. All of these, do you know what their role was? Collect zakat of the Shia, collect the khums of the Shia, and answer the questions of the Shia on behalf of the Imam. Imam al Askari had families who were ready to do this for him. The Nawbakhti family, the Mahziyar family, the Hamadani family, they were all working under Imam al Askari. Imam al Hujjah, as soon as he went on Ghaybat al Sughra, why did he go on Ghaybat al Sughra? In order to prepare us that when he is absent, there's going to be people who we can go to for all solutions. The first of them, of his four representatives, Ghaybat al Sughra was how long? 69 years. 69, 70 years. The first of his representatives was Uthman ibn Sa'id. And Uthman ibn Sa'id, the narration said to us, that this Uthman ibn Sa'id used to work for Imam al-Jawad from the age of 11. And then he worked for Imam al-Hadi. Then he worked for Imam al-Askari. Imam made him his first representative. You know these four wakala? In many cases, the Shia would come to them and they would ask them questions because in Ghaybat al-Sughra, they still had access directly to the Imam, these four wakala. Uthman, Later his son, then Hussein ibn Rawh. Hussein ibn Rawh, you know what these four, some of the Shia would say, if you truly are in touch with the Imam, then send us some of our proposals and questions which we have. They'd want them to perform miracles. Ali ibn Qummi comes to Hussein ibn Rawh, the third of the wakala of the Imam, third out of the four. He comes to him and he says to him, Oh, Imam, oh uh, Hussein, my name is Ali Al Qummi. He says, Yes. He said, I'm trying to have sons from my wife, but I can't have any. Can you ask the Imam to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For the Imam to pray to Allah that Allah honors me with sons. Hussein ibn Rawh said, What? Hussein ibn Rawh said, Leave this to me. I will speak with the Imam. And as soon as I speak to the Imam, I will come back with the confirmation. He spoke to the Imam. The Imam, that first Ghaybah was getting us ready for the Ghaybah al-Kubra. He went to speak to the Imam. The Imam told him, tell him, the wife he has now will give him no children. But he's going to marry another wife from Dalam, who's going to give him three sons, Muhammad, Hassan, and Hussein. Muhammad and Hussein will be ulama of this ummah. And truly, when he went and told him, he had three sons. He had Muhammad, Hassan, and Hussein. His son Muhammad, son of Ali al-Qummi, is the man famously known as Shaykh al-Saduq. That's why Shaykh al-Saduq was born from the prayers of Imam Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman. Shaykh al-Saduq. Author of the renowned text, so many texts you can mention, but arguably the most famous one, Man la al Faqih, one of our four main canonical books alongside Al Kafi by Shaykh Al Kulaini, Tahdib Al Ahkam, and Al Sabsar by Shaykh Al Tusi. Man la al Faqih is arguably the second most important book when it comes to Islamic law. Shaykh Al Saduq was the compiler. Hussein ibn Rawh spoke to the Imam, the Imam's prayers, Shaykh al-Saduq was born, until the last of them who was to leave, that last of them, the narrations, what do they say? That last of the deputies, the Imam told him, in six days time, you will pass away. And I am going to go on my major occultation. And I will return when the hearts are hardened and the earth is full of wickedness. And tell my followers that if they sincerely want me to return, I would return for them straight away. In that ghaybah, this long ghaybah, people ask the question. Number one, the first question. 
Can we ever see the Imam in this period? And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt tell us in many narrations that the Imam visits a number of people a year. And that there are three occasions in particular when the Imam is present. Of those occasions, number one in the period of Hajj. This year, insha'Allah, it will be my honor to be going with the group from Dar es Salaam with Hajj Jassa and the group. And I hope that every group that goes to Hajj this year has the honor of seeing the Imam of our time. That's the first. On the second, in a funeral of a man who has no debts. And number three, when someone is troubled, that is when the Imam will always be there for the people. Someone asks, why the ghaybah? The reason the ghaybah came is for three. Please understand these reasons. The first reason of the ghaybah is that definitely the natural reason that they wanted to kill the Imam because they knew of the prophecy of the Imam. So they wanted to kill the Imam, Allah took him into ghaybah. Number two, so that God will not allow the Imam to pledge allegiance to anyone in his lifetime. Imam al hujjah will not pledge allegiance to anyone. He will be his own leader. Number three and the most important is that it is a test for the followers of Imam al hujjah That this period of a prolonging, many people ask the question that we are unfortunate, we cannot see our Imam. We wish we can see him. Do you know what the narration say to us? One day a person came to our sixth Imam and he said, Who are the greatest ever Muslim generation? The sixth Imam said, The greatest ever Muslim generation are the followers and believers in Imam al Hujjah. Sixth Imam was asked why. He said, Because that generation believes in a man who they cannot see. And that if they work hard to prepare his return, Allah will raise them as if they were martyrs alongside the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Number one, he was to be killed. Number two, he doesn't pledge allegiance to anyone. No government will Imam put his hand on their allegiance. Number three, as a test for his followers. And that's why you find many people today ask certain questions. Some of them say, how could a man so young, age of five, how could he have such great knowledge? We in the religion of Islam believe Jesus spoke from the cradle. And when the Imam returns, Jesus will pray behind the Imam. So if Jesus speaks from the cradle with knowledge and he prays behind the Imam, then what knowledge does Imam have? Someone asks another question. If Imam is alive today, he would be 1,000. More than 1,000 and 200 years of age or in and around that figure. They say, how can this be? We reply, the Quran says, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam lived for 3,000 years, didn't he? The Quran says, Nabi Yunus when he was in the belly of the whale. Allah says, I wouldn't mind keeping you there till the day they are raised. How many years would that be? And even there's an existent by the name of Shaytan. You might have heard of him. He's been around for a very long time. Therefore, if someone believes in Shaytan being alone for that time, then why don't you believe Imam in that time? Someone says, how can you believe in an Imam you cannot see? I say he's not the first. The Prophet Jesus alayhi salam. Is he alive? Yes. Can we see him? No. Prophet Khadr, Prophet Idris, other prophets of God as well who are alive, can we see them? No. Do the Muslims believe in them? Yes. Even our holy prophet on the night of Hijrah when he left his house to go to Medina, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create a barrier where they couldn't see him leave the house? If Allah can do that for the grandfather of Mahdi, why can he not do that for Mahdi himself? And you find that there are many a sign which we have to be aware of. Signs which remind us about the Imam. Amongst the signs is the appearance of the Dajjal. That our sixth Imam says the day of judgment will not come in the rising of the Imam until 30 Dajjals appear. Dajjal as in an ideology which represents opposition to the truth of the religion of Islam. 
the Sufyani will appear where he will control Syria and Palestine and Jordan and the Bilad al-Sham area from the lineage of Abu Sufyan. Are we aware who the Sufyani may be today? Who is the Dajjal system today? And you find that the Imam will rise with 40 of his companions at Hajj. At Hajj, the year before he rises, he will be at Hajj. He meets his companions. They don't leave Hajj until the 15th of the Hajjah. And these companions from the 16th until the 22nd of the Hajjah are with the Imam. Then the Imam says to them, which one of you is willing to announce and to stand up by the, between the Rukun and the Maqam? One of his companions by the name of al nafs al zakiyah the pure soul, will stand up there and you will find that he is killed. And it's only a matter of 15 days later, most probably on the 10th of Muharram when the Imam rises. And when the Imam rises, he calls in an army of 313 generals, followed by over 10,000 soldiers, will come to follow the Imam. And the question arises, what are the signs that Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari narrates? That I one day saw him a dream, and this dream confused me. And when I met Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, I told him I saw this dream. Imam Ali said, the signs in your dream are the signs of the return of the Imam. What was his dream? Jabir says, the first thing that I dreamt, that I saw pieces of cloth hanging from the sky, and people were coming and taking pieces of the cloth, but leaving other pieces. So I said, oh Imam, what does this mean? Imam Ali said, before the return of the Mahdi, Muslims will take some parts of the religion and neglect other parts of their religion. Ask yourself today, have we taken some parts and neglected others? There are some parts we are very strict in, mashaAllah. Salah, we are strict. Fasting, we are strict. Other acts, we are strict. But then there are other acts, unfortunately, we show no strictness in whatsoever. We are showing neglect. We have become part-time Muslims. When we feel like being religious in Ramadan and Muharram, all of us are religious. Whereas when we do not feel like being religious, we do not mind breaking the rules in order that we follow our own ways. Imam said before the Mahdi comes, people will take parts of the religion and leave others. Then he said, oh Imam, I saw sick animals and I saw healthy animals. And I saw people going and taking and milking the sick animals and not the healthy. Imam said, that's the governments before the time of the Imam. They will take taxes from the rich and make sure the poor, the, uh, they will take taxes from the poor and make sure that the rich do not have to pay any. Then he said, oh Imam, I saw sick people and healthy people, but I saw the sick visiting the healthy and the healthy not visiting the sick. And the Imam looked at him and he said, in the period before the return of our Imam, the Qa'im of Al-Muhammad, in that period before him, you will find that the sick are the poor and they have to go and beg the rich for donations. Then he said, oh Imam, I saw animals with two heads. What does that mean? Imam looked at him and he said, before Imam Al-Mahdi comes, you will find that the human will have two heads. They earn money in halal, they earn money in haram. They earn money which is in a good way and in a bad way and they will not feel any remorse doing this. Ask yourself, do any of those apply to us today? Are some of us earning in halal and in haram? Are some of us taking parts of Islam and rejecting other parts? Are some of us making the poor beg us for money, even though we see so many poor, we don't give anything from our pockets. Are some of us making the poor pay taxes while us the rich are bribing ourselves away without taxes? Imam gave him all these signs to tell him what? To tell him that you want to know when the Imam is near, these are the signs of his reappearance. And that's why you find Imam will make his central government in Kufa. Where in Kufa? In Masjid al-Sahla. May Allah grant all of us the ziyarah of Masjid al-Sahla. And also amongst the acts of the Imam when he returns, we say it in Dua Nudba, one of the acts which is recommended for us to recite. 
Try and wake up on a Friday morning, brothers and sisters, after Salat al-Fajr. Try your hardest to read Dua Nudba, that Dua which Imam used to say, that the real lovers of Imam al-Mahdi after Salat al-Fajr open Dua Nudba. They stay awake and they read Dua Nudba. In that Dua, there are some memorable lines. Amongst those lines comes that line when we say, Ain al-Hasan, Ain al-Hussein. Aina Abna al Hussein. Where is Hassan? Where is Hussein? Where are the sons of Hussein? Salihun, Ba'da Salih, Wa Sadiqun, Ba'da Sadiq. And we continue by talking about where are the suns? Where are the moons that used to light up this earth? And you continue in your talking towards the Imam. You say about the Imam, Aina Sabab al Muttasil, Bain al Ard was Sama. Where is that connector between the heavens and the earth? Aina Talib Bidam al Maktul, Bikarbala. Where is that man who will come to avenge what happened at Karbala? As in when the Imam returns, his mission is to remove injustice. His mission is to remove tyranny. Never make the Imam sound like a person only for Muslims. The Imam is for the Hindus. The Imam is for the Zoroastrians. The Imam is for the Buddhists. The Imam is for the Sikh, for the Christian, for the Jew. Every single religion in their books talks of the Imam. And the Imam comes back as a man who seeks to build the government where the world is a world of justice, where the world is a world of equality, and where the world is a world where the tyrannical leaders are removed. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of us together on a night like this. How many examine the biography of the Imam? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Raise your hands. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه فيها طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with another dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna narghabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema. Tu'izzu biha al-Islam wa ahla. Wa tudillu biha al-Nifaq wa ahla. Wa taj'aluna fiha min al-Duaati ila ta'atik. Wal qadati ila sabiilik. Wa tarzuquna biha karamat al-dunya wal-akhara. Allahumma ma'arraftana min al-Haqi. Fahamilna wa ma'akasurna anhu. Fabalighna. We pray to Allah to allow us to be amongst the soldiers of Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst His servants. Allow us to be amongst those who are raised with the Imam of our time. Allow all our actions to be dedicated to the Imam and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the name of the Imam, all of us pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all our Muslim brothers around the Islamic world, especially those of our brothers who are ill. Ya Allah, in the name of Al Hujjah, cure them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-Muftar idha da'a wa yakshibu al-Suq. 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 We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa surat al-Fatiha. But before it, the loudest of your salawat. Um, here, and here, and here. And now we're done. Just take the left of yellow.